Hello, good afternoon. Welcome, every, everyone. My name is Elena de Juan Pardo. I am originally Spanish, so I hope you understand my accent, but I'm really, really delighted to be here with you today. I am new at the Perkins. I just uh, joined the family three months ago, and I would like to share with you the type of work we are doing in 3D printing. I'm not sure, like, first of all, how many of you are familiar with 3D printing, or you have heard of, yeah, a few of you have heard of, and how many of you have used it? Have you, you have used it, that's fantastic. So I thought first, so before I can tell you anything about printing biodegradable hard valves, first is that you understand what 3D printing is. So I also have a short video, but it's, it's quite pro proactive, so I hope it's, it's very short, a minute and a half, to explain what 3D printing is and how we can use it in the biomedical field. So 3D printing is taking over the world, but uh, how does it actually work? Well, it's quite similar to a normal printer, but then a little different. First, you don't put in an ink cartridge, but instead connect a spool of special printing material like plastic, rubber, or even metal. And you don't print boring text documents, but real-life models of what you've just made on your computer screen. Simply awesome. Right now, you can buy a 3D printer yourself and make complex 3D models with modeling software. But if you're not really a wizard with all that technical stuff, you can buy personalized 3D models online, like fancy toys, bracelets, or phone cases. Then send it to a 3D print shop nearby, choose a material, and pick up your own unique item. Sweet. In the medical world, they're developing 3D printers with special biological material. They're working on printing heart valves, ears, bones, skin, and even printed a small human kidney that can live for three months. It's just amazing. And hold on to your seats. They're developing a 3D printer that can print in space and are planning to print a moon base. A moon base! But, um... Still, the coolest thing you can print with a 3D printer is another 3D printer. Booyah! So, all right. So after after this video, I think you understand. Like 3D printing works, um, getting a material deposited on a collector, layer by layer. So you build an ob an object, like bottom up, we call it, and then yeah, it's cool. But when you think of how to use that technique to create body parts, you are like, oh my gosh, this sounds a little bit complicated. So what do you think we need to put inside that cartridge, inside that printer, to get you know, something that is biologically relevant that we can implant in a patient? And this slide shows you kind of the concept of how this 3D printing of body parts would work. It's like the main constituents of our body are obviously the cells that are inside in us and whatever the cells produce. So if we want to 3D print an organ or a heart valve, as I will show you today, so we scientists are occupied thinking about what cell, cell type we need, how to expand that cell type, how to combine it with a material together to build something in 3D that we can implant back in the body. And that said, sounds very simple, but how are we actually going to do that? So if we just be a bit more specific, think of techniques that are available, or also we develop our own techniques to build the structures with the cells, there are like two main groups of printers. And I hope after finishing the seminar, at least you, you go home with this idea. So if you hear in the news bioprinting, or you hear 3D printing, you will know the difference in both. Bioprinting is shown on the left-hand side of the slide. So bio-ink is the ink that you use in a bioprinter. And that ink is special because it contains living cells. So as you can imagine, the inks need to be quite gentle. And they are actually quite soft, like a gel-like structure. And the cells usually like it very much. But the problem with the bioprinters is that extruding or putting a cell through the stress of going through a print head is not very, you know, it's not very easy. Sometimes they get uh, sick or they, they don't behave in the same way. And then you need the material to, to, to maintain the shape because you don't want the gel to be put on the surface and then kind of collapse. So the shape fidelity is quite complex. On the right hand side, you can see what we call 3D printers using biomaterial inks or just the biomaterial. This is a cell-free approach. The advantage of this approach is you print something directly without having to worry about living cells in the ink cartridge. So you just print the biomaterial, something that goes down the collector, as you see here, and then you grow the cells afterwards on top of it. So you can either do it directly on the structure 
or you can combine it with one of those soft gels I mentioned to you before, and you can put the cells in there as well. But that also is another approach. The issues with that is, yeah, it's easier to print, but usually materials used for this printing technique are hard. I'm simplifying it. Of course, there is a variety of materials, but usually materials that you can use inside the body and you print like that become quite hard. So when you think of 3D printing tissues, using the right approach is a bit easier to translate because you print something that is cell-free and you can put inside the patient. Um, but then, being hard, what is the first tissue that comes to your mind to 3D print? Bone, probably, because that is the hardest structure we have. So what, that would be an example of how does, how does 3D printing work for bone, and then I explain for hard valves, which is a lot more complex. So first, you just have a patient with a cranial defect in this case. So you just get diagnosed with it, or you, whatever the surgeons do, the, the, the business, they take images with, micro, with CT scanning or MRI, and then you visualize the defect, and it goes to a computer where you can actually model it in 3D. And as you have seen in the previous video, from a model in the computer, you can 3D print the structure. And that is what engineers do. They use a specialized software to slice, we call it, to make that object layer by layer and send uh, instructions to the printer and get the object printed. So that's what happens in the machine. And then if you look to, through the microscope, this will be the structure that you can see with fibers orientated in this particular orientation for this case. You, you see that it's highly porous. Why is that? Because we want cells to embed it, and we want cells to produce new tissue. So porosity is very important. And then next, so this will be the defect. The, the, the white a contrast means bone. So empty space is no bone. So this is the cross-section of the cranial, cranium, and you can see how over time bone forms again. So I actually uh, wanted to show you this. Uh, this is a real example of a, a real leg this is actually 3D printed, and this was implanted into a patient in Brisbane where I was working before coming here. And I cannot tell you the whole story because it will take me very long. But I only wanted to tell you that 3D printing of heart tissues is a reality nowadays in the clinic. There is a, a company based here in Perth called Osteopor. They actually, commercial, they actually produce customized scaffolds of this type for treating, treatment of bone defects. Okay. But now, if you think of 3D printing a heart valve, uh, that's a whole different story. So I just want to choose to, to, to explain to you today hard valves because it's one of the most complex soft tissues we have in our body. It is really challenging to produce, and for us engineers, it's very interesting to think, what if we could actually engineer 3D print a hard valve? Then probably we could engineer other tissues as well. So it's a very nice um, a co concept. So first, again, what are the hard valves? How do they work? That's what we need to understand. Another short video to explain that to you. If it starts, yeah. The heart's main function is to pump blood to the rest of your body. The heart contains four valves. Normal valves have two or three flaps of tissue called leaflets that open and close like gates to control the flow of blood through your heart. Aortic stenosis is a buildup of calcium on the aortic valve leaflets, which causes the leaflets to become stiff over time. This buildup reduces their ability to fully open and close, decreasing blood flow to the rest of your body. Aortic stenosis is usually caused over time as we age, but can also be caused by a birth defect, previous chest radiation, or rheumatic fever. Unlike other forms of heart disease that are caused by genetics, diet, or lifestyle, and can be managed by medications, aortic stenosis is a mechanical problem that cannot be prevented. It can only be effectively fixed by replacing your diseased valve. Okay, so you see that a lot of people require a replacement of the diseased valve, usually at older stages in life. But I have to say, as you, as you heard, that also some babies get born with some congenital defects and they also need a, a valve replacement. And it's for those patients we are actually thinking of this concept of a biodegradable valve, something that you, you implant and it actually will grow with the patient, so it will not require further surgeries. You know, because the current solutions, you implant them, but they will not modify their shape or their size. And that is one of the main things. Anyway, uh, I could tell you a lot more, but I have limited time. So now, you understand what 3D printing is. You understand this thing of cells, machines. Now, for hard valves, 
engineers always think like, what is the requirements, you know, the design requirements? How do I need to make my valve to be functional? So what, these are like simplifying like four main characteristics of it. First of all, I need it to be strong enough, be mechanically strong. And in the heart, a heart valve opens and closes around 40 million cycles a, a year. So you can imagine that it has to be strong enough. Then cell-friendly is the, the main thing. Anything we put in our body, our immune system will protest. They don't like it. But we have to have something relatively friendly for the cells to you know, be at peace with it. And eventually, as I said, and if you see here, I want the material to slowly disappear, something bioresorbable or biodegradable, that once the cells have built the native tissue again, the material disappears. And last but not least, I need something with the proper shape. Yeah, because it has to do the job and that has to do with the shape. The anatomy of the valve is very key, very important. So how do we do that? What are normal heart valves made of? As I said at the beginning, they are made of cells and whatever the cells produce. And this is actually a cross section of a heart valve, as you see over there, they have like three, three leaflets we, we saw in the video. This is one of them open, it looks like folded or wrinkled, and those green areas, and here also in the cross-section, are collagen fibers. Collagen is one of the proteins most, most abundant in our body, and it actually provides mechanical stability to the soft tissues. So collagen is very important. This is what we use, the collagen structure that is wavy and is orientated, preferentially in some directions. We use that as a design concept for my printing, so for our printing, and this is a quite new novel concept. And then we can design something that looks like this. Eh? That for you is like, what is this now? This is what the engineers like to show. <laughs> it's just only this, this graph here tells you how, how easy it is to deform a material, how stiff or how hard it is. So the lower this line is, the, kind of the, the lower the slope means it's more elastic. It is very easy to stretch it. And then it becomes harder. So that, that graph goes up, it becomes harder. So it's something that is easy to deform and then it becomes stiffer. And how do we get that done? By printing and using the right technique. So there is a technique called melted or writing that I have brought to the Perkins, and I'm really looking forward to printing a lot more, that can print structures that are 10 micrometer size or even more smaller. What does that mean? So if you look at your hair, you know more or less how big, how thick your hair is. Mine is pretty thick, so <laughs> maybe more. 100 micrometer in diameter, which is 10 times smaller than one millimeter. So 10 micrometers is 10 times smaller than our hair. And that is what I print. And it looks like this when I print. So you see that little thing in the middle? It's transparent, but you can see the reflection of it is the jet. It's the size of the fibers we can print with. And to reduce fiber diameter, it's very, very good to actually control the elasticity of, this, of the structures we print in every direction and yet have some, something really highly porous. The more porosity, the better, because then the cells can embed it with native tissue. These structures have 90% air, 90% nothingness for the cells to embed, which is great. Um, so yeah, we combine these structures with soft gels, as I said at the beginning, and then we build the hearts. I have a few videos to show you the valves working, because if not, I don't think you will believe me. So this will be the constituent of the leaflets. This is what we use for the, for the flaps of the, of the heart valve, how they look under the microscope. And then when you put them together with a gel, this is in a slow motion, Looking from the top, this will be like looking at our heart, opening the Arctic valve pressure, the Arctic valve. This is how it looks. And you can see that it is like, we were so excited to see that actually it closes properly and opens properly, but obviously there are a lot of things we need to work on. So there are some, the gel is not very appropriate for this particular application, and we have tried to, to do it better. So showing from the lateral view, as you see here, this will be like the Arctic root and the valve inside, you see that these blue areas are the stitching points. This is how we have to actually manually attach the leaflets to the, to the root. And this is how the valves that patients get implanted nowadays are done. You have actually people suturing manually the valves, and it takes very long time, time consuming. If you do something wrong, one leaflet will be longer than the other that might not close properly. So we were happy to meet the requirements of the ISO standards. So we, we got the right numbers of, of opening and closing, but we know we want to simplify this process and make it easier. So that's why uh, we decided to, to continue. We also mm, were able to print the root, not just the leaflets, which you can see later if you want to come over here. And that was something also not so easy to do from the technical point of view. And you can see some images here. And then when we put the two of them together, so you still see the suturing. So you can, you can see how much pressure this root has to withstand as well. It's pretty impressive. So, but as I said, like, we wanted to get rid of those stitches. 
and we continue doing some engineering and some modeling and some programming to actually print. Uh, this is just a bad, a bad prototype, but just to print the leaflets and the root attached already. That we will minimize the number of stitches and will make it more stable long term. And this is done combining this, this scaffold with the gel again. We just 3D printed the mold for the gel to be embedded and to do it well. And we again put it together and this is a much better valve again. So I think I have a very short time now. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna finish. So just uh, to show you the view of the same scaffold, to kind of conclude what I wanted to show you today is that um, yeah, 3D printing of Harvalds is it looks promising, so it's not so far away. <laughs> uh, I just show you one approach, the approach we're taking, because we think it's, it's easy to translate compared to other approaches out there. But we still have a lot of work to be done, that's for sure. And then I, I think, what if, what if we actually optimize the design that I show you, because we can make it better? Uh, what if we just test these valves I show you in a reactor for millions of cycles, not for a few cycles? I need to test them a lot before I make sure I can implant them into any patient. What if I also combine them with cells to already understand how the cells will react to this material before I put them in, into a person, obviously? And what if also I, I test them? Eventually, I need to test them in a, in a model that allows me to understand long-term how it will behave in a person. Usually, we use uh, pig or sheep animal models. Yeah, and obviously, what if, if this works, then we could 3D print other body parts. So that's what I want to tell you. Thank you for your attention, and I will be happy to take your questions. How long does it take you to print a valve right now? Uh, long. That's a very good question because I am printing very small fibers. And to build the whole volume of it takes hours and sometimes days. So for example, for this, this, this one, it took us one day and a half, if I remember properly. It's a quite thick one. But yeah, this is only kind of a valid approach for personalized medicine. So I don't think you can commercialize this like massive scale. But and you can definitely have this for a particular patient in the hospital ready. Yeah. And during that process when you're printing, do you often find that it breaks and you have to discard and start again? Or I mean, at the beginning when we're, we don't know what we're doing, <laughs> it, it can happen. But once you find the optimal printing parameters, it's very stable, the process. We can print and print and print. Usually, which is very good. Thank yeah. you. Um, when I saw the topic for the talk and it said biodegradable heart valves, I was a bit anxious because biodegradable in the layman's understanding is this yes. thing's going to disintegrate. So yeah. does that just refer to the scaffold in the first e place exactly. and then it's, it's um, populated with the cells? Okay. And my second question, if I'm allowed, is to say ultimately when you've got it, that still gets sutured into position just mm -hmm. as a, a pig valve does now or a synthetic yeah, valve. That's correct. Okay, lovely. I was just wondering, does it, this process also use other um, cell technology like recombinant DNA technology for when you're actually isolating the cells to begin with? Uh, I could combine it with DNA technology, as you say. Like We could combine, and um, we haven't yet. We have done a bit of cell biology studies combining some smooth muscle cells, which is a cell type that forms the stroma, we call it, like the, the, the part of the valve that gives kind of mechanical stability. So we, but we haven't done crazy kind of genetic modification of the cells. We could to, to follow up, but at this moment, it's not, in, it's not needed, so yeah. How does the body's immune system react when it discovers all these weird substances? The, it its... reacts always, as I explained. Like, it always reacts depending on what material you put in there. It will react differently. And depending on the fiber size, it will react differently. So usually, uh, the material I work with is called polycaprolactone. It's already being used inside humans. So it's medical grade and approved for human use. So the advantage of our technique is that we can just print a material that has already approval and only ac apply for approval for the application, if that makes sense. So it's, it's much more direct um, translation. So the answer is yes, the immune response is big, or is a big factor contributing to the quality of the tissue that will be there. In fact, an immune response is actually a positive thing, as long as it is controlled, because you get invasion of cells that you need actually to populate the scaffold, to populate the valve with, the, with, with new form tissue. But yeah, then you have to go into the details, what sort of macrophages you get there, how they are polarized. So to, to, as I said, to get the right quality of tissue, not just scar tissue or fibrotic tissue, but the good one. Yeah. 
Is there an inflammatory response? Yeah, there is, there is. Yeah, as I say, like some materials are more, you know, they have a stronger response. This material is degrades so slowly that the response is very slow. So it's, it's quite mild. PCL is quite mild, but other materials like polylactic acid is very strong immune response. Yeah. Thank you. Um, in addition with the uh, inflammatory response, then um, would the also, also the uh, patient go through the uh, like anticoagulant uh, therapy as the you know patients who get the mechanical um, yeah. valve? Yeah. So yeah we, we, yeah, we haven't implanted this sort of scaffolds yet, but definitely they will need something. But as you know, there are different valves mm. in the market. So one, the mechanical ones need that for life, the anticoagulants. The right, okay. animal ones need much smaller amount mm -hmm. of something to dilute your, your blood, like yeah. a bit of aspirin, but a very, mm -hmm. small, a very small amount of it is enough to keep it going. Okay. I, would, I would assume with this approach it's the same. You need something to make sure you know, there are no clots being formed, but okay. not the amounts or the dosages you use for mechanical valves. So it's a lot more mild. It's actually good for your health to take a little bit of aspirin. <laughs> Apparently, it reduces the risk of heart attack right, when you're okay. over 50. And just one last question. So um, once you print out that, um, that artificial um, valve, yeah. so it, does it get recellularized and yep. then gets transplanted? It, there, are, there are two approaches. The one we want to pursue here is the mm -hmm. cell-free approach, which is, we call it in-situ regeneration. In-situ oh, okay. meaning in your body. You use okay. your body as your own bioreactor. The niche. That is the, exactly. Mm. Some people are trying to grow cells ex vivo in the lab mm. and then they implant it all. But it's okay. a lot more expensive and complex. But oh, we do okay. need to do both mm. to understand yep. how the valve will be repopulated or you know, remodeled. Totally, yeah. yeah okay. no thank you. Yeah. I think it's time for us to, to finish. Thank you for your attention. Yeah, and thank you for coming.